Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Open Source in Business. In this series, we've been shining a light on various aspects of open source uh, that don't usually get a lot of attention as they relate to the business world. And uh, this week, I'm joined by John Lilly. He worked for the Mozilla Corporation from 2005 to the end of 2010, uh, three of those years as CEO. And from 2011 to 2019, he was a partner with Greylock Partners, a venture capital fund based in the Silicon Valley. Thank you for joining me, John. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, so today we're going to talk about the impact that Mozilla had on the internet through uh, the decade, really from 2004, 2003 through uh, to um, uh, 2015, 2016. And um, I guess to, to get us started, can you tell us what you're up to now? Because you're, you're no longer at Greylock. Sure, I stopped investing. I'm still associated with Greylock. So I still sit on boards for Greylock, so I'm on boards of companies like Figma, which um, you know, redoing design, and Neuro, which is a robotics company, and Caffeine, which is a live stream company, a few others. So I've got a few boards for Greylock. And then I spend as much of the time as I can't, well, as much time as I can on nonprofit and mission oriented things around how we govern and how we run elections. So, uh, on board chair, something called Code for America, which is trying to figure out how to help local and state governments use technology to provide better better um, services, digital services to citizens and residents. And then, a company called Voting Works, which we may talk about, which um, I was involved with getting started a few years ago. And then I've got an eight year old and a 14 year old, and I'm trying to keep them in school during COVID. So, um, that, that takes more time than it sounds like, uh, but yeah. all parents watching will recognize I, I know what that's all about, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in Voting Works, and I definitely want to come back to it. I guess this is a busy week for you. Uh, do you have any um, voting machines who are go that are going to be counting elections next week? Yeah, the um, yeah, I'm, my friend named Ben Adida, who's worked with me at Mozilla, and is a, he has his PhD is in election security. He started a company um, maybe two, a little two and two years and change ago, and we were pretty worried about the security of our voting infrastructure. I think for obvious reasons at this point. Um, and so we just started. We started building voting machines that were open source, trying to build sort of the Firefox of voting machines at some level. And um, we are running elections, and we're doing a few things. We have we have do have some. We're running some absentee ballots in some states. Um, so both the creation of the absentee ballots and the counting of them, we're running accessible voting uh, in a number of states. And then we are running audits, uh, post-election audits in, I think, half a dozen or, seven, or eight states um, to try to figure out which states need recounts and which won't. Um, so they're called risk-limiting audits, RLAs. And so that, that's going to be an unfortunately important part of this election, I think. Okay. Um, so what's involved in a risk limiting audit? Do you sample the ballots, uh, make sure the count is correct? And Yeah, it's something, it's something like that. And I think that there were zero states that did it in 2016, or maybe just Colorado. Now, this, this year, I think it'll be Colorado plus the six or seven states that we're doing. Um, but yeah, it's that you've got, we really believe you need paper ballots and you need to be able to see for an audit trail until so you you know, you run the, the risk limit audit software called Arlo. You, it says, pull this ballot, pull this ballot, let's check it. If these, if they all check out within a certain confidence interval, then you don't need to pull more ballots. If they, if they don't check out, you need to pull, pull a few more and check again. Okay. So you get increasing confidence over certain rounds. So, so we'll see. It's going to be, um, it's going to be interesting to see both how the process works uh, in fairly stressed situations. And then how how the reporting works on it. So how people like, come to understand what's happening after the after the election day. Sounds like a, a fascinating potential real world implication of like Deming's work around uh, quality assurance and sampling. No. Yeah, I mean, I think right. I think there's actual statistics we need to do, and then helping people understand quality and understand how to think about statistics. And which you know, I'm not sure Americans are totally. Uh, I'm not sure we've been educated in the right way for to, to right. really understand what, what, what we're saying. As you know, borne out by a lot of people overestimating what a thirty percent chance of winning yeah. means from yeah. years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, underestimating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but getting back to Mozilla, uh, the the core of our uh, conversation today. So, um, a little bit of history: uh, the Mozilla project was created by Netscape. Uh, open sourced in 1998, 99? Yeah, that's right. In the 
the guy, I mean, that's a, that's a good story by itself. Like there's a guy named Bob Lisbon, who's the GM of, of Netscape back then. And, and because of Microsoft launching IE, I mean, back then, you know, you paid money for a browser every year. And when Microsoft launched it for free, sort of bundled with the operating system, which obviously would lead to the antitrust stuff later, the, um, you know, that forced Netscape's hand, forced Netscape to put it to free as well. And then there was this project inside Mozilla, uh, or sorry, inside Netscape, um, kind of being, it was actually what happened is that um, the story Bob tells is that he was up late one night and he started looking at the about boxes for the pieces of software from Microsoft that Netscape was competing with. And he started counting all the names of all the contributors because that was back when all the contributors were listed. And he got to like 2,600 names or something like that. And Netscape, the browser project had 200 total. And he just realized it was gonna be impossible for Netscape ever to compete symmetrically with Microsoft. And so he and I, along with Mitchell and Brendan, uh, you know, they started hatching this plan, looking at Linux to try to figure out like, well, how can we make open, an open source browser? Maybe that's the right way to compete in an asymmetric way with Microsoft. And I think what he told, when Bob tells the story, he says that, you know, convincing Barksdale to give the thing away for free, that was the hard, the hard one. Once it was free, Barksdale didn't much care whether it was open source or not. And so that's when, internal to Mozilla, internal to Netscape, the Mozilla open source project started in parallel with, with, uh, with the Netscape okay. browser. That's why Mozilla, it's called Mozilla, because the Netscape, the Netscape mascot was a dinosaur named Mozilla. I, th I thought it was called Mozilla because it was the mosaic killer. Nope. Oh, maybe. I mean, I don't know, actually. that, But that would be the dinosaur. The Mozilla project named after the dinosaur was, that was the Netscape mascot. And I don't know what the dinosaur is named after. <laughs> okay. Um, what role did Jamie Zawinski have to play in the um, in the open sourcing? My memory oh, is he was one of the primary proponents of it inside uh, inside Netscape. Yeah, you know, I've never met Jamie. So, I mean, he's obviously had a huge outsized impact on Mozilla over the years, and everybody at Mozilla was connected to him somehow. But his, 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 it was, you know, I got there in 2005, which was well after he had he had moved on. So I, I've never, I actually don't know. Okay. Um, do you think the open sourcing of Mozilla at the time was like a what do we got to, what have we got to lose play or was there actually conscious strategy behind we're going to open source the browser that will enable us to you know maintain market share in the server market or what was the, what was the thinking behind it? Yeah, I mean I don't know. I mean, you have to you have to really go back to talk, talk to Mitchell and Brendan and, and Bob. Um, but I think that I think it was probably a combination. I think that some people could see. I mean, my, my sense is that Bob, from Bob's point of view, the GM's point of view, from a business standpoint, it was like, what have we got to lose? Like, it might, might, might work. Um, and I think, you know, that point of view was borne out for a long time because Mozilla really wandered around in the wilderness for years after that. Yeah. To be, to be relevant. But but I do think that there's some people who looked at Linux and they said, you know, especially nerds, like te technology, I mean, this will be a common thread, but like you looked at Linux, you say, man, that's that's the future. That's changing the world and everything's gonna go that way. And so I think that you've got people like Mitchell and Brendan who looked at this and said, oh, this is this is the way. And so I think that there were people who, part. some people was like, what do we got to lose? Some people say, well, this will be the future and we can go, we can go um, change the world this way. Okay. So Netscape then got acquired by AOL. And yeah. in 2004, AOL decided to spin off Mozilla essentially as a separate nonprofit entity, the Mozilla Foundation. And well, yeah, 2003, 2004. Um, and it was a, I mean, it was a weird winding road. The kind of Netscape with parts of it went into Sun for a little while, then AOL, and by the time 2003 came around, AOL had maybe five or six different browser projects. Remember, there was a multi-render engine where they had IE's render and Fire and um, and Gecko in it, and there was the AOL browser, and you know, on and on and on. And there was this little group inside AOL, again helmed by Mitchell and Brendan, Mitchell Baker and Brendan Ike, um, who and they were working on Mozilla Suite, which was email and um, the browser and an HTML editor, because all these things were kind of like considered like you had to put them all together to have a right. compelling consumer project. And, and so um, none of the people, none of the original Netscape people inside AOL loved working there, and, but they all loved working on Mozilla. And so um, thanks to Mitch Kapor, 
the founder of Lotus, um, and you know, eventually founder of EFF. Uh, he was close to some of the AOL leadership. He helped he helped Mitchell and Brendan convince AOL to let it go, and okay. to get them the trademark to the word you know, tra trademarks to Mozilla and the source code and some of the office furniture and and a few bucks to to fund themselves. But but that was that was it. it wasn't much it wasn't much more than that. I remember a Joel Spalski blog post from, I guess maybe 2001, 2002, where he talked about one of the biggest strategic mistakes that Mozilla made was deciding to rewrite the engine, the core engine, after open sourcing. Uh, <laughs> was that an opinion shared by by the Mozilla team at the time? Do you think? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I doubt they took Joel's Joel's analysis as gospel for that, just because I think that. <laughs> <clears throat> when you when you get on the inside, especially about I mean, um, yeah, browser engineers and render engineers are, are it's an unusual set of people. It's a little bit like operating system engineers. I mean, for for what it's worth, and and so I think that you you don't really rewrite a browser engine because you you're pretty sure you need it. And Brendan, you know, well, Brendan's been you know building up building JavaScript since 1995. Right. And so he's he's not one to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So like he, I think that you know, you know maybe Joel was right, but I don't think so. I think that Gecko, Gecko has its problems, but it, it was a really robust engine for a long, long time. So I don't, okay. I don't think anybody was unhappy about having rewritten it. I mean, I think the the real shooting started when um, when there's a before I got there. Still, I mean, it's 2003, 2004, when when some people internal to, to the Mozilla project said, you know, people don't need an email bundle with their browser and people don't need a, uh, um, an HTML editor. What they really want is a fast browser. We'll call it, you know, Phoenix. And right. eventually that would become Firefox. But that was, a, that was a really radical idea. And it was not so much about the backend technology as it was about what packaging the consumer wanted. And that was Blake Ross and Ben. Ben Goodger, yeah. yeah. I mean, but look, I mean, you know, there were a lot of people involved in that decision, and there's a lot of apocryphal stories about who was against it, who was for it. It was a yep. complicated decision, but like, the truth is, once once a simple, fast browser came out with Phoenix, maybe zero point five, zero point six, people really loved it, and it was just became really obvious that that's what that's what the the market wanted. Well, the, I recall that the zeitgeist around that time was that there was heavy institutional investment in Mozilla Communicator as uh, the suite, as the, the kind of the main thing that Mozilla was going to work on. And that, you know, the, the early versions of Phoenix, what became Firefox were um, uh, essentially a skunk works project that people did almost, you know, behind the veil without letting people know until it, until it got to a point where they were ready to show it. Is that how it happened in reality or was it an yeah. actual conscious decision to do a, a lightweight browser? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I it's a pretty conscious decision, but it, it doesn't mean it was a, it was a um, unanimously held conscious decision. So I think that it was a project that people set out on, but I do think that that's an interesting point, which is that open source projects, they have a tendency to kill new things because when you've got new, any new idea, when you've got this default open, you share this brand new idea and like the idea, new ideas are like little hothouse flowers. Like if you look at them wrong, they wilt. And, and so I think that most projects that are successful, they have enough heft to withstand some of the stop energy, but are still clearly, clearly not finished. And so that's, um, anyway, so I think that's, that, that's sort of the essence of how to do things. Okay. In open. So going back to the, the moment where Mozilla foundation spun off, uh, AOL. Um, at that time, I remember thinking like it was a couple of million dollars, I believe, was the initial um, funding from AOL for Mozilla Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember thinking that you were going to have a really tough time building a business proposal. At the time, I think white labeling uh, Mozilla Communicator for various companies was the, the main business model. Um, was that a difficult time? How did you happen on the revenue model that ended up being yeah, well, again, like this is this predates me. So if you the, the timing was two thousand three, something like that, two thousand four, and I think that's true that it was not clear what the Mozilla business model was going to be. Um, you know, I was around the project, but I was not I was not inside the project. My my involvement sort of started because I was involved with um, 
another open source project sort of by Mitch Kapoor called the Open Source Application Foundation. And he was trying to build something called Chandler, or he did build something called Chandler with his team. And that was supposed to be like a new version of Agenda uh, from the Lotus days, so like a note-taking, uh, collaborative note-taking tool. And that didn't really work, but it was interesting because in, I think it shows you, it's one indicator of how unlikely Mozilla was to succeed is that there was a book um, called Dreaming in Code by I think Scott Rosenberg. And he came out and hung out in the office of Mitch. Mitch's offices for Open Source Application Foundation were on Howard Street in San Francisco. And he gave office space to Mitchell and the Mozilla folks. And so Mitchell, eventually Mitchell and I were on the board and Tim Riley were on the board of that. Um, and, and Scott wrote this book about, about open source code and his conclusion was, man, open, uh, the software is really hard. Software, will, big software projects will never work. And it's, be, it's because he was looking at Chandler and he was ignoring this other thing that was in the building, Mozilla, because Mozilla didn't seem very interesting, whereas Chandler seemed exciting. And it just goes to show you that Mozilla didn't know their business model. It wasn't clear they were going to build something that people loved. Um, there was a lot that was uncertain and not obvious to like even pretty informed observers at the time. I think um, I remember Chandler. I even remember trying it out at one point, and um, and I seem to I I remember thinking that it was building a like a huge piece of software almost monolithically. You couldn't it it wasn't really usable until it was finished. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Mozilla was starting from an existing user base, and as you said, you know when Firefox came out um, or the the early releases of Phoenix came out. Um, People really loved it because it was exactly what they were looking for. Um, so, do you like? I guess thinking of a question, um, what did you? The early success of Firefox. Um, what drove that early success? What What was the aspect of you know the Firefox user base that attracted it to? Sure. Well, early versions were still a little rougher on the edges sometimes. <laughs> well, yeah. So a couple of things. So, I mean, I think there's a, there's a number of answers to that question. Um, but but I would say that even even then, it was not totally clear how to make open source really sing in for consumers. And Linux had looked like it was succeeding. There's some other open source projects, but there've been no big consumer breakthroughs. And I think in retrospect, if you look at consumer open source. Um, you know what consumer open source is best at is like taking an existing product and making it like suck 30% less. And so it's like we took a browser and we made it suck less than the other browser did. What it's not as good at is, you know, how do you create something new from whole cloth? Because it's just a it's a different type of thinking and different type of problem. Um, but I would say that you you go back to Phoenix and Firebird and eventually Firefox in 2004, especially 2004 was the pivotal year because. Um, you know, in, uh, Microsoft and Internet Explorer had gone and disbanded uh, most of the IE group. They had figured they had finally, you know, put a bullet in the in the web, and they had sent a lot of those guys off to work on Silverlight, uh, which was their flash competitor at the time. Um, and um, there, but a couple of things happened. So number one is just from a consumer standpoint, the experience still was crap, which would be, you know. In, only old people will remember this, but like you'd go into the office every day on your Windows laptop and you code, 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 and then you'd get ready to go home and you'd have to start closing all the pop under windows that had popped up, popped up with ads all day. And you'd have, you know, literally you'd have between 100 and 200 for, during the day. It was just a huge, awful experience. Um, and then the second thing is that uh, Mozilla, I don't think was the first to implement tab browsing, but people really liked tabs in the browser because it started to help you consolidate some of the windows that you that you'd collect. Uh, as you worked on a project or during the day. And then the third thing is a US CERT, the security organization issued a warning, a security warning and said, hey, look, IE is not always secure. You should, at a minimum, you should have a separate browser like Firefox on your desktop. And so that drove a lot of a lot of adoption. Um, and then, you know, they eventually launched Firefox 1.0 1 .1 in November of 2004. And uh, they had something like 10, 10 million downloads that first month. And that was a quite a quite a lot quite a large number for any project like this. I mean, it was largest by a long stretch. Wasn't that the, the the release where they did the full page New York Times ad? Was that 1.0? Yeah, 1.0. 1.0 had a couple of things that were notable. One is that obviously it had well, I mean, 
zero point nine. They, they've integrated search prior to that. So Google and Yahoo with Google as the default search engine had come in a few a few releases before that. But but you're right. They to announce the project, they they took out they were going to take out a one page uh, Firefox ad, and so they crowdsourced it back before crowdsourcing was much of a thing. And they basically said, look, if you give us um, if you give us ten bucks or hundred bucks, whatever it is, whatever the number is, we'll we'll buy this ad and we'll have everybody's name, and it sort of builds the picture of Firefox in the New York Times. And it was so successful, they ended up taking two pages out in the New York Times. And obviously, that was a that was kind of characteristic of the way that um, Mozilla Press. And I, I credit a lot of this to Chris Beard, who would eventually become the CEO. And I worked with his head of marketing for a long time, um, but he always would find ways to do um, marketing and press where the press itself was interesting, but the way they did it also generated process stories. And so he yeah. always had double or triple bangs in the way he way he did press. He's just a really genuinely talented marketer. And I was it, it was amazing, like leveraging the Firefox community and this enthusiastic yeah. user base as a way to fund. Uh, that was that was just I, I remember that. That was that gave me war the warm and fuzzies back in the, yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Um, so your early audience was kind of built primarily on, as you've hinted at, um, momentum users, um, geeks, hardware, uh, yeah. hardware, like internet developers. Um, so how important was that early momentum in internet developers for your, your consumer success later on? Yeah, it was everything. It was really everything. And, um, if you think about what, I mean, Firefox is a good fast browser with, with no with no pop-ups and tab browsing and integrated search. So that was all in, and it's secure. And so that was all a pretty big deal. Um, but what really helped developers love it was um, the extensions like Firebug uh, and Firebug Director. What's that? I'm yeah, the Firebug Director, JavaScript debugger. That's right. So tools really for building what would become Web Web two .io. This is right at the beginning of Gmail. And so Gmail was the first app that was in a browser. You're like, oh, maybe you can put genuine applications in a browser instead of just web pages. But it was a huge pain in the ass to code. Um, and so you needed debuggers and inspectors and that kind of stuff. And Firefox's were like blew away what you could do with Internet Explorer. And so developers started building interesting web apps on Firefox. And so so a couple of things happened then is that we started getting natural adoption, and then we started getting adoption with, from developers, and then because um, unmanaged computers were the norm then, as opposed to what we have now with Android and iOS, like developers who were doing support for their for their families and their libraries and their schools, they would say, "Well, I'd rather support Firefox on this than IE." And so, did you have this explosion of people, nerds, doing installs of Firefox on every machine they ever touched? And so that and then so that kind of like was a virtuous cycle. And then you know you'd get into we get into the four five six percent market share range, which is not usually enough to to move things. But because the developers were doing the development of web apps on Firefox, it meant they they tested on Firefox. And so once we got to seven or eight percent as a default, like most almost every application being written uh, on the web was a, was being written in Firefox, and that meant that it worked. It tended to work better in Firefox than it did in IE. Um, and that was became a, um, a self-perpetuating cycle. And so after we got to, I mean, this is about when I got there, maybe four or five percent. Like we were quickly to eight or nine percent. And by the time we got to eight or nine percent, we looked. It felt like we were going to be a fixture for a very, very long time. That was in two thousand five. So do you do you remember? Did you have stats on on plugins and extensions and themes? How important were things like themes for Firefox to adoption? What was the median number of extensions that people had? Did people have anything more than just AdBlock? Uh, yeah, I mean, people had a lot of extensions, and in fact, um, the I mean, I don't know about themes. Themes are interesting, but the extensions actually caused a big problem for us over time because they were basically privileged pieces of code that ran in the browser, and you couldn't because we we didn't have tab separation or memory process separation between tabs, for example. So if you had something running in a tab that would <clears throat> took down the browser, it would take the whole browser. Extensions tended to leak memory because they were trusted. And so this whole combination made it quite hard to actually understand what's happening in the wild a lot of times. And 2007 was a 2007 2008 was a tough year for us, and it, it because of the riot, it's when we started getting our reputation for being bloated as a browser. Mm -hmm. And it's because and the, one of the like the trickiest things for us, and it sounds ridiculous, was the rise of a, a Zynga game called Farmville, 
a casual game where you'd go, you know, build crops and harvest them and trade them for money. So and it's because Varnville is built in Flash, which is a plugin on an extension, but Flash uh, tended to leak memory. Um, it tended to take down your whole browser. And because Farmville went from sort of zero to 100 million people in the space of about a year, it was really hard for us to, to debug that plus all the other extensions that people might have installed. I think we made it too easy to install extensions and they were too unmanaged. And eventually that that got fixed because it moved to more like a grease monkey model that, that Chrome has that is more, that's less privileged and more managed. And that's what Firefox has now. So, Mozilla has the unique distinction of having been um, at its beginning against the Mozilla Internet Explorer monopoly and now facing down the mobile web, Chrome, Safari, not monopoly, but hegemony, I guess, or, or a, yeah. um, uh, oligopoly. Um, how have you... Like, how did you get over that hump of the entire web was dependent on Flash and ActiveX and OLE and Com controls back in the early 2000s? Uh, were people dying to get away from that stuff, or did you have to overcome that as a significant barrier to adoption? Yeah, it was it was an ongoing uh, conversation. OLE and Com are the ones that they were a big deal, um, just because it was easier to it was easy to code an application, internal application of Visual Basic. And <clears throat> stick uh, stick a com control or only control in the web page, and it most often happened in the name of security. So, like Microsoft's, like um, their connection to the big banks was yeah. really good. so. Oh, you know, Korean uh, had actually legislated for ActiveX controls for bank. Banking. That's true. Yeah, that good times. Um, yeah, so like that for that stuff, we just had to commit to people that it wasn't it wasn't any more secure. And in fact, it was a little bit scarier because you had closed source. But that was still at a time when. It was not a widely held under, understanding that open source could create more secure systems because people said, well, if you can look the layman's views, if you can read the source code, it must be easier to hack. And actually the converse is true in a bunch of crypto kind of ways. But the, um, so it was hard. I mean, we just had to keep going and we had to believe in the web. Um, Flash was contentious. Um, you know, we had a lot of conversations with, um, with Adobe about that, and as they started building their their things that included Flash and the web. I can't remember what it was called. They had they had a future of Flash thing, um, and I don't know. We just we always felt like Flash was not the web and was not inspectable or codable in the same way. And so we just we just had to have a belief in the web. And so we just kept kept investing in developers and investing in the this, this, the system, and then being kind of as steadfast as we could. Um, you know, I think that we Mozilla didn't. I mean, it was Steve Jobs that, that killed Flash ultimately, um, and uh, which is funny because Kevin Lynch, uh, who ran ran Flash for Adobe at the time, now runs Apple Watch uh, in Cupertino. But it was Steve's memo on on thoughts on Flash that I think really put a nail in their coffin. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, but I think that it took a lot of pressure over a lot of time, and it's just there was no there was no shortcuts. Uh, how significant was uh, kind of the 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 standardization of JavaScript and ECMA and uh, the standardization of HTML5 and CSS 1.0 and, and things like that in terms of driving a standard web which allowed you to compete more fairly against uh, the likes of, you know, and to create accessible, the accessible web. I mean, I remember accessibility being a huge argument for Mozilla back in 2005, 2006. Yeah. Yeah. This is one where, um, there are people who are better than me to talk about this stuff. I was not super involved with ECMA. You know, ECMA is, you know, it's like the creation of like HTML5, ECMAScript and sort of the new JavaScript. Um, what I would say is that I think that the, the um, there is, you know, movements to standardize things and there are movements to add more functionality and you're, the web is, all, is always in both, it's got both motions going on. So one is like, how do we make it more standard so that you write once, run everywhere, which has always been the, the promise of the web and it's not so much the reality. So to be standard, but also trying to keep up with platforms. And that was a time when, you know, Windows and Mac were not super like fast moving. Um, I would say iOS and Android then would eventually come through this <clears throat> phase where they were like super fast moving and very, very hard to keep up for anybody except for these principles. But I would say that the truth is for most technology platforms, 
standardization does not lead functionality ever. Um, it's really like who has the who has the user base, who has the user base with a desire to have more functionality, and who can go code that in a way that doesn't make everybody else throw up on throw up on it. So I want to dig in there for a little bit. Is standardization doesn't lead functionality, but presumably Mozilla invested in the standardization process for those technologies because they saw a benefit in it. Sure. Um, what is the benefit of standardization in terms of, you know? How do you justify that expense? Do you justify it purely in terms of this will make a better experience for our consumers? Or is there also a, um, if we don't get these standards in place, this will damage our adoption, will lead to us being marginalized? It wasn't an adoption question. The um, uh, Mozilla is not, not Firefox. And it took me like some time to figure this out. Uh, you know, I first came in, I thought we should change the, the you know, unknown name of Mozilla as the organization to Firefox because Firefox is the thing, the, people, the thing in the brand that people all recognize. But if you if you really look at what Mozilla is even today, like it's not the browser. Like Mozilla, Mozilla's view is that we're living. I mean, I think Mitchell would say the same same thing. Now, Mitchell, the the chair and the, the chairwoman and the CEO there now, and and the founder. Um, you know, it was always like we're living more and more of our lives online, and we should it should be inclusive, and everybody should be able to have a say in what that technology looks like and how what the experience looks like, not just wait till they get the the Apple keynote once a year or Google developer days to be told what's going to happen. And so the browser obviously is, uh, Mozilla always felt like the browser was the key front door to all this stuff for now. And Firefox market share was the best, best tool we had. Mitchell's point of view always has been that you get most of your power from adoption from users using it and not from, just some, you don't get moral authority without having users, basically. Right. And so we had to have enough users who gave a damn about Firefox in order to be able to, to hold Apple and Microsoft and Google accountable in some ways. And if you think really about what, what we wanted was an open, an open internet that was shaped by more than just these technology companies. And I think, I think on the desktop that, that largely played out, I think in on mobile, it's not at all as clear that that, that that's the arc we're on. Um, it, it, these are closed platforms. There's not none of these guys are quite as asleep at the wheel as Microsoft was with with Internet Explorer, right? Um, and so we'll see. But but the browser was never the point. The point was that we wanted an open internet. But I think, and you certainly succeeded, right? You've got um, WebKit, uh, so Safari, uh, Chrome, Chromium, and I, I remember watching uh, Tristan Nito. Uh, who was your European marketing head yeah. at some point, uh, and uh, sort of glibly saying, you know, Internet Explorer 8 was Mozilla's best release ever, um, most successful release ever, uh, the, the saying that, you know, that was the point at which it was clear that Mozilla had really had a huge impact on the web because everybody was moving to this more open, um, more secure, uh, that, that that was a sign that, you know, Microsoft had reinvested in the web. Mm -hmm. um, so have I mean, have, are you done? Is is the mission accomplished? What's a, how how what is the continued relevance of Microsoft today? Or not Microsoft, Mozilla, excuse me. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'm just a fan. Like I, I I'm not involved anymore. I left the board in uh, 2013. I um but I talked to Mitchell and I'm a huge fan of hers and I'm a huge fan of the people that, are, that have devoted their lives to life to it. I think that the browser, as you know, is not as important as it used to be. I think that there are people who wish it would be, and there are people who are trying to make it more important. Uh, as they should, um, but, you know, I live a lot of my life in apps on my phone too. And so I think the question, in my view, the question is like, that they really should answer is like, what's the, what's the next arc look like for Mozilla over five or 10 years? It's a really robust organization economically. They've, they've built a really like the strongest, like market, um, supported, uh, Nonprofit that I know of in the world. Um, it's an uh, it's an undertold story, probably. But the um, but the, but if you look at if you, if you look at the relevance of the browser on making sure that people's lives are open, 
or the, the internet's open, I think it's on the wane. And so the question I think that Mitchell and the team are trying to figure out now is like, well, Firefox is a really good first act. What do we do now? And how do we, how do we, what's the, what's the unifying mission? And there's lots of one. I mean, my view is that there's like, there are huge and obvious Mozilla shaped holes in the world right now. We really need Mozilla for um, user sovereignty, for privacy rights, for um, some pushback on surveillance capitalism. Um, but also um, as a, as a, as a, a sort of a hymn to open creation where uh, permissionless innovation. And so I think they're working on all those things. I think that the trick is always like, what's the product that that is the biggest leverage point that right. that's what they're working on is my sense. Well, it's been tough recently, like Firefox OS never really got the traction um, that, that the organization hoped. Um, so wh where is the like where is the next big opportunity? Is it in data sovereignty and privacy? Well, I think it's I think that's <clears throat> one one possibility. I think there if you look at what Mozilla if you kind of look at the breadcrumbs where Mozilla is now, they've got a lot of stuff around contests and ventures and open innovation and supporting people that are kind of playing around the edges of a lot of interesting different tech, crypto stuff like that. And so um, the question with data privacy and data sovereignty and stuff like that is whether normal humans care about it enough. Everyone gets worked up about the NSA or whatever spying on us, but then they'll also give your, you know, I put my, my name and my address into Starbucks, into the Starbucks app so I can get my free latte or whatever. So yeah. I think that, you know, we all say we care about privacy, but in practice, we don't always act that way. Now, we may be going through a sea change on that stuff. Um, and there are signs that that, is a possibility, um, but I think that the shape of the product is not totally clear to me. So, but I also think that Mozilla has always been really good at not assuming that the best ideas come from inside the building. And so, if you create a community, if you kind of tend it and water it and feed it, that over time, like the game becomes like how do you how do you encourage innovation, and then how do you amplify and bubble up innovation that you see happening that, that's useful. And so I think that's that's where they are now. Um, I think that Firefox is still used by <clears throat> tens, to, the, tens to hundreds of millions of people a day. And so they're, they're not irrelevant. Uh, but they've got work to do to figure out how to be best. So rounding the circle, following on from the point that you just made about privacy and people becoming increasingly aware of it, being in, in an election cycle again, people are increasingly aware of the, the, the issues around surveillance capitalism with Facebook and Google. Uh, and Twitter, and we've seen these this creation of centers of gravity of the web, where you know you can entirely live your life on in three websites now, uh, which is never the view that people that like Tim Berners Lee had of 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 the web back in back in the day, and and that's created a situation where there's an opportunity for large technology vendors to essentially create a link between their web properties and the the ways in which you access it. Uh, so Google applications working better on Android than they do on other platforms, or um, you know, uh, your iPhone working better with Safari than or requiring Safari for certain applications or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, what is the, you know, is, is Mozilla still an effective hedge against that kind of thing? And how how dangerous do you see that kind of trend to the open web, the, the vision that, that Mozilla had originally. Yeah, it's a problem. So I think there's no, there's no, I think there are no individual companies or organizations that can be effective hedges here. And I think that there, Tim, Tim Wu, uh, a professor wrote a book a little while ago called The Master Switch. It's instructive and it's worth reading. And he talks about basically how technology always goes through three, three waves. The first wave is, is when you're in the, in the, garage and it's proprietary and it's closed. So you, you invent radio, you met the, the light bulb or whatever. And then the second the second wave, second phase of technology is when it all kind of opens up. And so like the, the pieces get well understood and it becomes horizontally commoditized. And so like you've got a different plate, you know, the wireless radio versus the screen versus whatever. And so they become and they become the interfaces become standardized in between them. So you get this open open phase where standardization really matters. And then a third phase 
everything closes down again around nodes and distribution. So how you get how you get the software. And it's happened with radio and happened with TV, it happened with newspapers. It's really happened with everything. And it's happened with, with the web, which is the web kind of started small and then it became very horizontal as people understood it. And now it's closed down again around, as you know, Facebook and Google, by and large, Apple. Uh, uh, by dance and others. Um, and so the only thing that really breaks those is a new S curve. The only thing that really breaks them is a new technology platform that is asymmetric and different and kind of attacks from the side. I think for a lot of, for a while, people really thought that it was going to be VR or AR and they might still like, um, you know, the Oculus 2, Oculus Quest 2 from Facebook is a really big step forward. Um, people thought maybe crypto was going to be the driver. The thing about these S curves is it's really hard, and you know I think Andreessen talked about it. Talks about it in his essay. He said, "Look, crypto looks like the web did 20 years ago. Um, they're really they're really hard to predict because they really look like goofball offshoots that are not not the main not in the main part of the bullseye. And it's almost by definition, um, if it's in the part of the main part of the bullseye, the big companies are going to be focused on it. And so, so I'd say that." You almost need a new Esker. What I would say, though, is that the big com big companies now, Apple and Google and Facebook in particular, and Microsoft as well, they understand this is what happens. And so they are more promiscuous with new technologies that look goofy than they ever have been before. And so they understand how this is how networks get disrupted and how nodes of distribution get disrupted. And so they're watching for it, and which just sort of ensures that it's going to be even, even more oddball a thing to come in and, and, and cut it. Right. And so we'll, we'll just have to see. I mean, it could be that, you know, uh, something like, and then, but then there's always curveballs. And so, you know, nobody really could have predicted that Zoom was going to be a $150 billion market cap company until the pandemic happened. And so, so the world has a way of like changing starting conditions and changing assumptions about things. And I think that's real possible coming up. So we'll see. So you mentioned earlier that um, like Mozilla has succeeded in creating a, a pretty huge nonprofit entity. Uh, yeah. One of the big drivers for that has been the revenue model, which I'm not sure everybody watching this, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that most of the people who are going to watch this video are familiar with it. But can you go into how that happened? Like, how did, how did it happen that you ended up happening on this, you know, tens of millions of dollars per year revenue model from search referral? Yeah, well, it's hundreds of millions now, so it's it's a big number. The um, and it, again, it predated me. So, the story that Mitchell and Mitchell will tell is that, you know, they got to some release of Firefox in 2004, and they're spending down this money that they had gotten from AOL, and they're trying to figure out like how to make how to make uh, ends meet. And then they had done a, a release, uh, and then they and they went out to dinner to celebrate. And then it turns out that while they were gone at dinner, that Larry and Sergey, and this is the story I heard, but Larry and Sergey came and knocked on the door, Larry and Sergey from Google, because they were big Firefox users, and they just wanted to talk to the team and say congratulations. And then there was nobody there. And so then the, the next day it happened again, and so they started talking to Larry and Sergey a little bit, and they said, well, what do you need? And Mitchell said, well, we're about to run out of money. And Larry and Sergey said, oh, we can fix that. This is before Google went public. And so they put together a deal, a search deal, which is Mozilla, are, Firefox already had integrated search. And so we already had Google and search bar because people wanted as the default. We already had Yahoo built in. And they said, well, we can just pay you a search referral fee uh, tra for our tech, traffic acquisition costs. And that was the genesis of the, of the search deal. Um, it was quickly generating millions of dollars a month in revenue, which was much, much more than anybody modeled. Just people really liked it. People really liked searching from the toolbar, and it was coincided with the rise of Google as well. And so that that's where it started. Um, over t over the years, Mozilla has gone back, gone around, and done different deals, both in the U.S. Um, you know, whether it's Yahoo or Google, and in other geographies. So um, with Baidu and um, Rakuten and um, uh, um, Yandex, and so just a number of deals around the world, mostly search. Uh, what, it, what it's meant is that the revenue model for Mozilla has always been very, very simple. We have only got a few checks a month from very, very large players, um, and very robust. Um, and so it does mean that they're they're quite reliant on Google revenue now, mm -hmm. which I think will get some uh, some renewed 
uh, scrutinied given the Google antitrust stuff. Um, but but we'll see we'll see how it goes. So in those early days, um, I remember you had Yahoo.jp was the search engine for Japan. Yahoo was more popular in Japan. Baidu yep. in China. Yandex in, in Russia. Um, like the leading search has always been very much there's been one dominant search engine per geo. Um, how difficult has that made renegotiating those search referral deals with you know the likes of Google and Yandex? Yeah, I mean Mitchell did most of this stuff, um, and it was always it was always like uh, a little tricky um, because people say, well, we don't want to pay for cannibalizing our search. Um, but the truth is, there are very few levers that were as big as Firefox, and so okay. um, it's true that. I mean, defaults really do change behavior. So mm -hmm. if you push a default, like you definitely lose, lose, lose users. But how big of a threat is it if you know if you change the default to Yahoo or or you know the Microsoft search and and um, eight eight out of ten of your users switch it back to Google because that's what they prefer. Eight out of ten won't. Eight out of ten people will never switch defaults. And so uh, even if it's something where it's like synonymous with the term, like maybe you get three or four out of 10 switching, but it's still okay. a huge, a huge dent. Um, and really the truth is like, it, it's very hard to find any lever on the internet that will that's worth a hundred million users. There's almost none of them. And so it was a pretty big deal. Um, and I, so I think that, I mean, that was part of it. But the other part of it was like, people understood even, even very, very competitive companies understood that uh, Mozilla at, in the large and Mitchell in specifically was really just trying to make the world into a more equitable and fair place. And so it's hard to really play like massive hardball with an organization that really, that really loved by users, really loved by regulators, and is trying to make the world the right, the, the right way. Um, but so that, but it's so that there's some combination of that plus like raw self interest uh, <laughs> that, that, that drove. So I'm, I I don't I don't know if it's something that you attach a lot of importance to, but certainly um, the role of the Firefox trademark in the open source world, at least, um, a lot of people will remember the dispute between Mozilla and the Debian project and the creation of. The ice weasel fork of of Firefox and um, how important was it's it's been something of a theme in this process in this uh, series that you know trademark controlling your trademark as point of origin is one of the fundamental ways that you build value that you can then monetize in a in a business model whether it's uh, whether it's uh, Red Hat monetizing Red Hat Enterprise Linux or um, you know, MongoDB being seen as that, you know, Mongo being seen as the point of origin for MongoDB. Um, how important was it for Firefox, the trademark to be like, have a pretty strong protection in terms of uh, its success? So, well, when you say um, almost everyone will remember the dispute you guys had with DB and oh, my audience, it's almost maybe, maybe almost all of your friends will, but like, <laughs> I, I kind of forgot about it. So, um, it, it's a very nerd, nerd specific topic, but the, um, but what you notice, right, which is open source has always been great about copyright law and always been really mute about what to do about trademarks. And it's cause it's a different, different form of law. Um, trademark was always for consumers. So it's like, how do you, how are you sure that when you go to the store and you buy a can of Coca-Cola on the shelf, it's real Coca-Cola. Um, and, uh, and so the, the government gives you the right to assert trademark to keep other people to for consumer safety, basically consumer surety. And Mitchell, um, you know, I don't know if people know this, but like Mitchell is a lawyer, so she understood this stuff from the from the jump, and she understood that when people are going to be using this thing to get their internet and do their banking and their school and everything on, it had to be secure and people cons normal people not server operators not developers normal people had to have uh faith that it was really actual firefox um and so we were always strong trademark and we took a lot of heat from that in in the open source community so people said well we're not free software and the richard stallman um uh tradition or whatever which was true 
uh, we were asserting rights and we were saying you can do this, you can't do this, which you know some people, some libertarians uh, don't love, and but we felt like it was a it was requirement for consumers to be able to use. To, to, be, to be useful to consumers at all. And so that was, that was the right decision. Um, it made people mad. So it meant they couldn't use the logo or the, far, the trademark or whatever. Um, and we just had to take it. It was, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think there was any question that's the right thing to do. I think that it still probably makes people mad uh, today. I have to say from a personal point of view, I've never seen any conflict between being free software and having strong trademark protections. I've, I've, like you said, I see them as orthogonal. So I don't think, Personally, I don't think that affects the, the the freedom or not of the software. Yeah, yeah. I, I think different people have different views on this, and uh, I don't care what the term is. I just think as a practical matter, if if I don't if I'm not sure what Firefox is, then I don't really want to use it. Okay. So um, before we wrap up, I want to touch on your career in venture capital. One of the things when we were preparing for this, you mentioned is that you'd never been involved in an open source deal in venture capital. Yeah, and I was wondering if you could talk about some of the reasons why you personally have not um, gravitated towards uh, VC investment in open source companies. Yeah, well, so so my my investments at Greylock tended to be um, consumer, so Instagram, Tumblr, stuff like that, where open source is kind of immaterial, or they tended to be at the application layer uh, for SaaS, so things like Figma and Quip. And I, for both of them, they'll they'll use open source to to get the outputs, but really the output is the is the web is the web or the application uh, itself. And there, my partner uh, Jerry Chen um, did more open source stuff than I did because he was doing more infrastructure. And I think on the infrastructure side, it is pretty important that things are open source. Um, I just think that uh, it's horses for courses. You got to have the right horse for the right course, mm -hmm. and like. For me, it just wasn't it wasn't obvious that there were open source that you needed open source to be successful in certain things. Now you'll see like things like Figma, I book like communities and networks and open open communities are really critical in almost everything um, and give you ways of distribution. But nobody cares about whether Figma itself is open source. They'll care about whether the file format is open source over time. They'll care about whether the APIs are open. And there'll be interesting and meaningful debates to have there. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So, how much of a red flag would it be as a VC investor if the company was pitching, creating their software supply chain from scratch versus using open source or investing in open source? Like, how how much do you look for companies that are uh, saying, you know, we build on Node.js and we have a committer there, uh, I, or is the like we have a committer there not something that's important at all? And sometimes it's important, sometimes it's not. So I think you have to be to figure out for the right company. I mean, the, the biggest software IPO in history now was Snowflake, and Snowflake's all proprietary from scratch. And so um, if you said, well, if you're not like taking advantage of open source, it's going to make you go slower. Well, now when you were wrong, you lost a lot of money. Zoom, I think, is very, very, very low open source. It's almost all proprietary. But then there, there are huge companies that are open, like Elasticsearch and others that are, that are WordPress. Um, that are open source, like uh, forever and ever. So hmm. I just think it depends. I think you've got to have, like everything, you've got to understand how the supply chain, your software supply chain integrates with, uh, sort of interacts with what you're trying to build in your consumer base and your distribution strategy and your monetization strategy. It's all got to kind of, it's all got to kind of hang together and right. every industry is a little different. I think, um, and we've got a, a presentation coming up on this topic. I think one of the things that I've noticed is uh, that companies who invest in open source as a way to commoditize their supply chain, kind of lower the cost of, you know, getting new people who are skilled in using the, the frameworks they're using, things like uh, React JS or um, uh, what's the Envoy from Lyft or projects like that. Um, those projects tend to be, you know, very successful and uh, uh, there's not a huge business opportunity behind them. But there's a huge business opportunity behind what you build with them. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a common pattern. But I would also say, like, like successful ventures almost always like they're black swans. They almost never look like the thing before. And so, reading too much 
about what's come before and what that implies about the, the shape of the company in the future, I think is right. kind of a sucker's game. Okay. So it's kind of a su survivor bias playing out and where you where you look at the, the companies who are successful and you say that we got to be like them, but it's in fact... Yeah, that's what I think. Companies that were like them failed as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could, I mean, we're all smart. We could, I can, I can give you a pattern. I can tell you it's a constellation. Oh, it looks like a, looks like a bear in the sky. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, thank you very much for joining me. Um, I, I do want to give a, a shout out for our next show. Uh, we're going to be talking about, um, let's see, it's election day. And on November 3rd, we're going to have Allison. Uh, uh, I'm, I should have been better prepared. Um, Genato, uh, better known as, as uh, Snipe, uh, or Snipey Head from Twitter, and Roberto Gallopini, uh, who are going to be talking about starting bootstrapped self-funded companies and some of the things that go into that. And, uh, you know, they're smaller companies, but it's how does your role change going from an indi in individual contributor to a CEO? Um, what are the uh, kind of business opportunities and revenue opportunities that are available for people who are who are who are starting a company around an open source project? And um, it's going to be an interesting conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, John, thank you very much for joining us today. Of course, thanks. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. And we're